We are all set. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Go ahead. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Conservation Development um, agency meeting today. First up, we have the Department of Housing. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm State Rep Bobby Gibson from the 15th District. Um, I'd like to um, give my Senate co-chair, Senator Hartley, um, a chance to make any remarks if she would feel, feel free to do so. He hasn't joined us yet, Mr. Chair. Okay, I just thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I'd like to give um, ranking members Summers and Ferraro the chance to make any opening remarks. Uh, Senator Summers. I don't, don't believe she or Representative Carr are with us yet. Okay, hey, okay, then we're ready to go. Um, Commissioner uh, Bruno, good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks for coming into our meeting today and sharing up information with us. Um, I'll let you just get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Uh, I have with me my staff. Um, let me go back. I'm Sela Mosquera Bruno, Commissioner of the Department of Housing. And with me today, I have Michael Santoro. He's Director of Policy Research and Housing Support. Steve Talila, Director of Individual and Family Support Services. And Don Parker, Director of Unite CT. So uh, we sent um, answer some of the questions that we had and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have from our submission. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll give committee members a chance to um, get their questions together. Any committee members have questions? Um, <clears throat> I have a, a couple of questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. It's great to see you and your staff. It's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thank you. I hope you're doing well, too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> every day is a blessing. Um, yeah. I, I would like to uh, know, how many people do you have on your staff with filled positions? With filled positions... I have about um, 42, including uh, the positions that are supported by the federal um, programs that we run. So could you break that down for us a little bit better? Um, when you say 42 positions, because according to the OFA sheets, you have 23. So yes, those are uh, 23 <laughs> positions that are within the budget of the state. And okay. then we have programs uh, that we manage uh, federal programs and we pay from those programs, the additional staff that I have. And all, all, all 42 positions are filled? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at Michael. Michael, <laughs> I, I believe, I think there's some that aren't filled. So maybe Michael can just give us a little bit of illumination on that. Michael, Michael go ahead. If you will, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the a conservation Development Committee. Um, I'm Mike Santoro, the Director of Policy Research and Housing Support, and just a damn old guy who's been here a long time. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> we have 23 general funded positions, um, mm -hmm. and we have, I will say it this way, a variable number of federal positions based on available administrative funding from the wide variety of federal programs that we administer. Mm -hmm. We have 42 current staff at the department, um, we are in the process of hiring um, a number of durational staff to support the new Unite CT program, um, which is being uh, managed by uh, Don Parker, who is here um, for the department. I believe, Don, you have, and just hold up, I think you have four positions that are being filled currently. Um, and that is correct, thank you. Um, so at the moment, we have four vacant positions we are looking to fill. Um, at the same time, we are looking at three additional positions across the agency, again, that will be funded and supported using our federal administrative dollars. 
Um, but all of our 23 general funded positions are currently full. Okay, so the, the, the positions that aren't filled are the ones that, <clears throat> that are uh, federally funded? Correct. Okay, and could you explain to us what Unite Safety is, please? Yeah. I, will, I would be okay. happy to do so, but um, I will actually ask um, our program director for Unite CT, who is okay. brought, on, brought on specifically um, to address that program. Dawn, um, please yeah. try to be uh, brief, but direct. Good morning, everybody. So good morning. Unite, good night. Um, Unite CT is actually, it's the 200 and it's about $235 million that's coming into the state from the CARES Act. And it's going to be the emergency um, rental program. Um, we expect to, we actually started it this week with people that had applied at T, through TRAP and we had um, closed that program. So we wanted, there was 2,500 homes that we wanted to get in as quick as possible because we knew their level of need. The program is meant to serve households that are up to 80% of HUD area median income and households who have been financially hit because of the COVID pandemic. So something in their house has shifted. Um, we, have actually, we have presentations that we're making in the community. So if you, have, if you have networks that you'd like us to present, please reach out to me and we're happy, happy to present about the program as well. I think that something to know that's really wonderful is there was an admin fee through this program. And so there has been software that's been purchased it's called, the system is called Yardi, and it goes from pre-eligibility all the way to funding. And so it's a very inclusive, um, low barrier mm -hmm. system. And we have, it's very user-friendly. And we also have housing counseling agencies and other community partners that will be helping for those who have technology barriers throughout the state as well. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm you, you, I didn't know about this, so I'm, I, I apologize about the, um, this, this whole thing. So this is strictly funded under the CARES Act funding. There is no other funding besides it. So it has a shelf life of how long? So the money? Months. 18 months. So th this is the CARES Act, uh, the December stimulus package that was passed. Right. So is uh, the emergency rent relief, and yes, it's just um, that's the, the two million thirty two hundred and thirty five million eight hundred seventy thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. okay. So the program is to provide support for agency. I don't know, um... The program is to provide support for renters under RAP programs. So we're, we're extending this through RAP programs, no? No, it's a new program. It's a new program, but it's emergency rental assistance. It will help um, households who need um, arrearages to get caught up or forward payments of rent. There's a $10,000 cap on the amount of rent that can be allocated on behalf of that tenant. And we also will, are able to pay arrearages in utilities the gas and electric utilities, and there's a cap on that of fifteen hundred dollars per household. But wait, so you can a little slower. Um, ten thousand. Oh, sorry. Ten thousand per household on rent, and yep. and then the other is uh five thousand or fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred mm -hmm. per household. Now for the rent, just so you know, you can do arrearages and forward rent but the utilities is just arrearages. Okay, past, past tense, okay. Yeah. And, and that's per household also. And this is in the max in the whole program, correct? <clears throat> the max amount of money? No. In other words, you get one time. Yes. You get, you get one time. Okay, so 235 million, okay. So what's your expectation for, for, for doing this and, and how many households are you trying to reach? 
We think that we will be able to engage about 25,000 households in this program. Okay. Um, but that's the, if, if you did 25,000 in this program and let's say 10,000, that's in excess of what, what the amount is, but you're assuming that mostly everybody's not going to hit the 10,000 mark. Yep. Yeah. We've, we've done some, we've gotten some feedback based on the, the TRAP um, use and other rental assistance programs. Mm -hmm. And also we have information that um, a study was done to show that people are on average are about 3.8 months in arrearages. So that's, we're thinking that that's, um, well, that's a best judgment, right? That we're, we're hoping for the 25,000 households. Okay. Now what happened to the money that we had, we got under um, the CARES Act, the 20, 2 million or 24 million that we had before was that 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 was expended through um wraps before or is that money still around or is that going to be blended into this money no um and i'm gonna have michael to have the exact numbers because he ran the program so michael okay. certainly thank you commissioner and, and again um thank you um madam chair um <clears throat> we were allocated 26 million 26 million seven hundred and seventy two thousand dollars of the original cares act funding that was from the first crf um we rolled that out through the temporary rental housing assistance program and we were able to assist six thousand seven hundred and forty six households with that 26 million seven hundred and seventy two thousand dollars Okay. Um, those funds have been fully expended. We are cleaning up, if you will. We've had some landlord repayments and some additional payments go out, but we will, um, by the time all the mess is cleaned up, um, have fully spent that $26 million. Okay. And do you have, do you have where these locations were throughout the state? Uh, yes. Um, I don't know if we prepared and sent to OFA that breakdown already if not we can certainly do that um we oh i see michelle shaking her head um did we get that we previously got some statistics on the distribution let me look at it and i, I can certainly send it to the committee thank you and and michelle if you need more breakdown um uh, get back to me let me know what um what kind of analysis you may need and we'll do the best we can um based on the information available break it down for you Okay, of the, the, the 67, did we give any assistance on um, for utilities? No, that program um, was not a utility assistance program. It was strictly um, rent um, and it was capped at $4,000 per household based on the limited amount of money um, that was allocated. The new allocation um, under um, the second relief package um, uh, mm -hmm. The 235 million and change um, mm -hmm. allows both rent and utilities um, right. under clear under guidance from the treasury, and so we will be uh, making both available. So, how many landlords did we assist? Did we or did you break it out that way, or was it just to the rent? So, payments did go directly to landlords. Um, mm -hmm. We made payments to approximately. Um, and I think this is on the breakdown that I sent to Michelle. Okay. Um, I believe we were looking at somewhere around 660 landlords, something in that neighborhood. It gets a little tricky because sometimes a landlord operates under multiple names for individual LLCs, but it's the same landlord. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of, you know, messing with those numbers, it gets a little, uh, unclear, but um, we believe somewhere uh, a little over 600 individual landlords um, received payments under the program. Okay, so under this program, okay. Um, that's fascinating. And I, I, I thank you so much for, for providing us with that information because we've never gotten that type of information that I can find in any of my multiple notes. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's been an elusive butterfly, I will say in getting the details on where that is. So I go back to Unite Connect, Unite CT. Um, Dawn, you were brought on when to do this? I just wanna know. The end of February. Okay. okay. I think it was, I think it was, I mean, it was really the end. I think that my 
um, it was like the beginning of March that I started, but it was, it was really recent. It hasn't been a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And I, I I realize. I mean, I understand. And you had, um, opportunity you, you, uh, have you worked with in the state? I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry to ask that because I, we, no, we, were that's all okay. to figure out, we were all trying to figure out on your call um, who you were and whether we could <laughs> let you in or not, or whether you're going to, you know, photo bomb us or something. So, uh, <laughs> okay. No, I'm supposed to be here now. <laughs> um, I actually, I've been in the state of Connecticut in housing for um, 15, over 15 years. I just, so, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I apologize. I don't mean to, to, to get into that. Okay. I just, I just um, wanted to know if you were somebody who came from maybe OPM or, or one of the other agencies. And no, so no, that's, 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 that's all I, that's all I needed to know. So um, as of the end of February, you started and this program for your, for, for your lifetime will be um, 18 months. Correct. Yes. Yep. yep. Has, and does any other state use Yardi software? There are, so this is all happening in real time. Um, they have, I, I don't know how many states right now. There were like five states when we had started this process who were talking to them about also using the program. And I know that they went live um, at the beginning of the month with, with some other states, but I don't have like a summary of who else they are working with. Who, who do you know who, who created Yard, Yardy software? So Yardy software has actually been around for a long time. It's a property management software company. And so because, um, oh, I can't even remember how many people they serve. It's like millions of of people that they serve across the country. Mm -hmm. And what they knew that people needed this emergency um, rental type software system. So they just, they, they created that out of what they usually do. So it's something that they're, they're used to doing for a long period of time. So, so Madam, if I can add, Madam Chair, if I can add a little bit, uh, we started this process, Michael and I, and OPM and the uh, governor's office about um, the middle of February or the beginning of February, actually, to look for software. So we interview about a dozen of software companies and programs. And then at the end, when we brought um, Don, we decided that Yari was the best program that could actually set up the system right away. And they gave us a three weeks window that we could start the program. And we were looking for something that we could expedite the process. Um, So they committed to have this process ready for March 15, which we are on target. Okay, well, thank you. And I apologize to my colleagues. I got, um, I, I I just didn't, this was something that was brand new and I didn't know anything about it. And, and I hope I, I gave them an opportunity to hear about. So thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Madam Chair. Thanks for those questions and thanks for the answers. I think the next hand up was Senator Olson. Good morning, Senator. Uh, good morning, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm good. Sorry, I'm doing two meetings at once. So I do have a, Representative Datham, you're not muted. Oh, um, um, so, uh, I have uh, leading off of what Representative Walker was talking about. Uh, can uh, people from Tranche One who got help get help in Tranche Two? Yes, it, they can. As as long as we don't overlap sorry, Peter. with the <laughs> with the payments that they received or the month that we paid for it. But yes, they can. And um, how do landlords get involved in this? So I have a lot of small landlords in Eastern Connecticut. Is there a direct number that they can call to get some information on this? Yeah, this is actually this system. I'm sorry, Commissioner. This system is amazing for landlords because the online portal is accessible through by the tenant or the landlord. So landlords can initiate the process. And, and then, it's on. And how do they so do we that? Have, on the Department of Housing website is a section, Unite CT, and everything everything about the program, we're directing people there just in case if things change at the treasury or anything like that. Um, the portal for applications will be right on that website. It's a very easy process. And if, if like 
a landlord or a tenant has a smartphone, they can do the application and they can take photos of their documentation right there and upload. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's user friendly. Okay. And so they go to the DOH website, Unite CT, and the application is right on there. Correct. And, and the landlord can initiate it and the renter can then add in the yep. correct information and the payments are made directly to the landlord? Correct. Correct. Okay. And they great. can sign up for direct deposit so that it's faster too. Okay, great. All right. Um, and I, I just want to make clear that somebody who got money in tranche one can get money in tranche two. Yes. You can That's totally, all. just not overlapping the payments. Okay, so they can say if they got money for March, April, May, they can't get May, June, July, but they could get June, July, August. Correct. Oh, okay, great. And commissioner for you, um, I have a small unit in um, the town that I live in in Sprague that I've been trying to um, get some weigh in on uh, that the DOH approved the funding for, um, and it was approved out of CIA funds that you are sort of um, responsible for. And every time I ask, they say, no, we didn't give any money, but I went back and checked. Yes, you did $111,000. And um, the, uh, that's not being used at all right now. And I think that that's a travesty that you put $111,000 into it and uh, now it's not being used. So I just want to follow up with that with you, um, you know, because when I talked with um, your legislative uh, liaison, he said, we didn't put any money into that. And that's just not true. I double checked, triple checked. I was there when the money came in. And I just would like to follow up with that because that property is now possibly being sold to a private developer after you put the money in to do that. And that was not the intent of it. Just saying. Um, thank you, Senator Austin, for that. Uh, Michael, um, you were doing a little research on that property. Senator Austin, if I may, um, we looked back and we could not find any information That's on the project that you're talking about. If you can email me with what you know about the project. Yep. Um, I, I, we have looked and searched our records. You're saying it was CIA money. And if you can tell me when, yep. um, we'll try to track it down a little better. But thank you very much. All right, please great. follow Thank up. You, you, I believe you have my email. Um, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for those questions and thanks for the answers. Uh, next up, I see Rep. Dathan. Good morning, Rep. Dathan. Good morning, Rep. Gibson. Nice to see you this morning. You as um, well. Thank you for chairing and uh, thank you commissioner today for your presentation. It's nice to see you again. I know last time I saw you, you were in New Canaan at our new housing development that was being built and it's coming along really nicely. So thank you for your support there. Um, I have uh, two questions. First of all, I was wondering, um, you know, it's really helpful to look through your um, written explanations, uh, especially regarding the COVID things. I still don't have a, a really good number, uh, an understanding of how many people each of these programs helped. So I do see CRF um, had 6,700 people that were helped, but some of these other um, emergency rental assistance, um, what would be great is if we had like a, a schedule that we could produce by each of those um, programs to say the number of people that have been helped and um, also like a, another column that might say, you know, additional people that additional um, people that could be helped under this program. And this is how much money we have left. And then if there are any restrictions, like it has to be used by a certain period, if we could get like a schedule of all of those for the, um, the COVID dollars, um, does that make sense? Um. And, and this is on, on all the different programs, I think. Um, Steve, did, did you provide that table? 
We certainly provided a table of uh, the amount of funding that was allocated and into each individual program. I think it's important to realize that with uh, some of the funding that came to the homeless service system, a lot of that was used to uh, ensure the health and safety of those served. So what we're really looking at is we have the, the same number of folks that are entering into the system, but we needed to provide, you know, PPE for, for the staff as well as the, uh, as well as the homeless folks were serving. And in addition, uh, I think as uh, many of you know, we did do a shelter deconcentration effort and then also access hotels to be able to create enough social distancing space to keep folks as safe as possible during the pandemic. So a lot of, a lot of our funding really was to just ensure the safety of the folks that we serve, not necessarily that we were taking in additional uh, individuals with that funding. We just want to make sure that the people that we did serve uh, certainly uh, had the ability to stay safe from COVID. Certainly now as we're moving along, uh, uh, with some of the other rent um, assistance that we have through that CARES Act money, like the rapid housing program. Once again, we're taking people who are in shelters and who are in hotels and trying to put them out into the community. So I think that will certainly be helpful. Um, and as we get more in depth in that, we can certainly start generating numbers for you on that end. So I, I'm sorry, I missed the schedule. Where, where is it? Um, can you just direct me, Steve? I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, it should have been included. If you give me a cool, I'm not the, if this was teams, I'd share, oh, I, may, I might be able to share my screen on this. So if you give me a minute, I can potentially try to pop it up. Hang on. I went through the, it was a Word doc and then I had two other Word, yeah. um, Excel sheets. It should have been an Excel spreadsheet. And the Excel, one of the Excel sheet was CIA funding awarded applications. Um, okay. And then there was another one, uh, ESG. Yes, uh, that one. Look, yeah, look at the ESG one. Yeah, so I'm looking and at that one, but I don't see um, uh, that's just dollars. You know, again, I'd yeah. love to know how many people and how many, um, what the sort of driver is behind those um, for the CARES dollars. Yeah. Sure. So we, we, we could certainly give you some uh, numbers related to that, but once again, it really isn't designed like the uh, Unite CT where it's serving unique individuals that we've never served before. It really was to serve those who are already in the system and provide them with the proper safety measures to ensure that they were as safe as possible from COVID. But we can certainly give overall numbers, but those numbers will track very consistently with the number of individuals we would serve even without that funding. Okay. Um, well, that goes on to my second um, request is, um, Steve, do you produce like maybe a dashboard for your um, agency that maybe would be um, for each of the programs and the housing programs that you have? Um, maybe uh, if we can get a, a like a three year, 2019, 2020 and 2021, um, sort of where we, a uh, number of individuals we help in each program. And if you can um, indicate which line item of the budget that would be just so I can kind of get an understanding of our trends of a uh, number of people that we um, assist in, um, in housing and how that might be looking uh, if those trends are, are accurate. I have a little concerns over, um, I, I know it's not a line item of yours, but um, I've been, we had a human services meeting uh, earlier this week and one of the agencies that's been really helpful to um, help emergency homelessness um, has lost uh, uh, quite a bit of funding this year in our budget. And so it just has, a, I have a lot of concerns about making sure that we're um, still helping uh, the people that need to be helped and that um, are, you know, we're budgeting appropriately because so many people right now, especially during COVID are really suffering and really need the rental assistance. And um, I mean, we've seen that. I know you, I'm probably pre preaching to the choir right here, um, but uh, just wanna try to get an understanding of where we've been and where we're going. 
So, sure. so if, if you really want to dig down deep into some of our homeless service programs, uh, we have been able to create this really innovative dashboard. Um, DOH doesn't technically own it. Uh, it's, it's managed through our homeless management information system, but we obviously fund a piece of that and we have partnerships. Um, so that dashboard really gives a treasure trove of information related to our homeless service system. Anything from the first uh, coordinated entry appointment to homeless outreach, to emergency shelter, to wrap rehousing and then finally to permanent supportive housing. So I can certainly share that link and you can uh, look at it, uh, play around with it. I won't need that much detail. I really just want to see, you know, for each um, housing program, I mean, I think it's great that you have that sort of management tool at your fingertips, but my more thinking is really to get an annual trend uh, for three years for each um, housing program that you uh, have within Department of Housing. Um, and then just like a description, is it a temporary release? Is it, what does it mean? And then um, kind of just to get an idea of uh, the number of people that we've served in, in a three year period and really an understanding of, you know, going forward, um, is that going to be um, adequate for, um, uh, you know, our, our budget going forward, especially in light of where we are. Yeah, and it's I nice think to know we have these. I was just going to say, it's nice to know we have the, COVID dollars that are going to help with with some of these crisis situations. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. I'm just talking. No problem. Uh, certainly, uh, when you look at like the RAP program, we can easily give numbers for that, and then even some of our uh, our HIV AIDS programs we can. But when we start talking about some of the programs like our emergency shelters and our rapid rehousing programs. It will be very difficult to break out just the general friend fund uh, portion of that because obviously we tap into a variety of different resources. So when you look at our homeless shelters, you know the general fund uh, funds approximately you know 30 to 40 percent of those shelters. Uh, we also have additional funding coming in from uh, federal sources. So like to break it down specifically, yeah, you don't need to necessarily break it down. I would just put in. A, a note column, you know, 30% funded by state of Connecticut, X, you know, X percent fund, or whatever the allocations are, but just to see the total numbers of people served and whether it's 100% paid for by the general fund or um, it's a split between federal dollars, you know, it, that can just be noted in the side. I'm just more curious to, to see our trends. Sure. Thank okay. you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're, you're welcome, Rep. Dathan, and thank you for those answers. Um, actually, Rep. Dathan, you, you sort of stole some of my questions, which is cool. Um, and if the questions that I'm about to ask, if they were asked already, please forgive me. I had someone come into my office, and I had to um, refocus my attention. But um, a couple questions. A question on e evictions. Um, prior to, what, could someone explain I understand that the people who are, fell into hardship during the pandemic and the executive order um, are covered, but um, how about people who were um, in the eviction process when COVID hit? Can someone um, just touch on that? Yeah, I'm gonna ask Michael to um, respond to that question, Michael. Certainly, Commissioner, and, and again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, when COVID hit, um, we knew there were approximately 800 active eviction actions in the state of Connecticut for a variety uh, of reasons that ranged from non-payment of rent to serious nuisance to lapse of time um, or other cause-related activities. Since COVID hit, the implementation of the governor's executive order to put a moratorium on evictions, which has then gone through a number of uh, modifications to the current executive order, which does allow some evictions to move forward despite the pandemic um, for specific situations, such as more than six months of non-payment, um, serious nuisance um, related to drug activity, um, and a, a couple of other uh, exceptions that are spelled out pretty clearly in the executive order. Um, we know that there are currently 3,800 uh, evictions in process. <clears throat> Some of them are not moving forward because of the eviction moratorium. That is, landlords have started the process and they're on hold. 
and they will remain on hold as long as either the CDC moratorium or the governor's executive order remains in place. Those evictions that meet those exceptions under the executive order and don't also meet the um, provisions within the CDC eviction moratorium have and will continue to move forward. Um, right now we have uh, what we call a homeless prevention program, which is really designed specifically to prevent evictions. It's tied directly through our coordinated access network and the housing mediators at the judicial branch um, to connect individuals in that eviction process who are in fact close to losing their homes to assistance under that housing uh, homeless prevention program. Um, I believe that program um, is well underway. It's coordinated through Steve uh, and his staff, <coughs> again, in conjunction with coordinated access networks um, and the judicial branch. Um, but as we go forward, um, once Unite CT is up and running, which again, is targeted for Monday, um, we believe we can bring those numbers substantially down um, by putting these resources into play. Um, in addition to the regular access there where any landlord or tenant can um, log on to the department's website and begin an application, um, we're in active conversations with uh, the legal aid organizations across the state of Connecticut um, to tie them and into um, the process to allow direct contact between individuals and tenants um, in the eviction process um, with uh, legal services and coordinate their access to the United CT program. Um, our hope is to forestall as much of those evictions that are non-payment related as possible. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That was pretty thorough. Um, now, now the same the same question, but as far as uh, landlords are concerned, the landlords who were about to, or who are in trouble of um, going into foreclosure prior to uh, the pandemic. Um, and, and let me make sure I understand the question, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. You want to know what's being done for those landlords that may have been in trouble before COVID hit? Yes, correct. Yeah, okay. That, that, yeah. um, I don't know that um, anything specific is being done to help those landlords. Um, if they had problems before COVID um, of a financial nature, there are programs and opportunities out there that may be able to help them, but they existed pre-COVID um, and they are still in existence. Um, there are a, a host of uh, multifamily uh, assistance programs, including um, FHA insured mortgages, which have received significant forbearance from the federal government. Um, I believe under the original CARES Act, um, they got a one year forbearance where they didn't have to make any payments on FHA insured mortgages. By the way, about 80% of the multifamily um, mortgage loans that are out there on the market are FHA insured. Um, I believe that the second relief bill also extended that for another six months I am not sure if the new uh, American Recovery Act includes any um, affiliated or associated uh, extensions of that relief. I believe there are, but to be frank, I haven't finished the thousands of pages of that American Relief Bill yet um, to focus on those things that are not directly um, related to what we are doing at the Department of Housing. I believe there may be additional extensions of that FHA forbearance, um, but I am not certain. Well, thank you for my, Michael for that. Um, but even with those, those programs, isn't it just like kicking a can down the street that uh, you know they don't have to pay for a while, but they're going to have to pay, right? Um, it, uh, Mr. Chairman, you are correct. It is just kicking the can down the road, if you will. Um, but when you think about the problem itself, they are landlords, they are in business, make a profit. Um, yes, they've been severely impacted and they were having issues before COVID. Um, there was something wrong with their business model. It, this has given them the opportunity to hopefully correct that business model or to deal with it in another fashion. Um, there are programs, however, for refinance, especially in today's inexpensive capital market um, for those property owners to look at recapitalizing their properties. Um, and we encourage them to do so either through FHA or through our partner organization, CHA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, who has a number of programs um, that may be able to assist them. Um, but in short, if you were a commercial landlord 
Uh, you were a landlord that had residential property and you were in trouble before COVID. Um, the, the relief programs that have been put in place by the federal government have not done anything to solve your problem that existed prior to COVID. They've allowed you to deal with it and kick it down the road, kick the can down the road as you suggested. Um, but I don't believe any of those programs have created a solution um, to address a bad business model. Thank you for that, Michael. I really appreciate it. All right, next up, I see Senator Hartley. Good morning, Senator Hartley. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, my apologies. Um, I got a call today that said, uh, you can come down and get your shot. And I was like, okay, thank you. I will be there in 10 minutes. So um, my, my apologies. Um, and uh, Madam um, Commissioner, thank you so much for being with us. And um, I first of all want to recognize the incredible um, work that has been done regarding housing. Housing is uh, one of those agencies that um, really was pivotal in, in this pandemic. It continues to be. Um, and so uh, from what I was able to just uh, connect here on our meeting, uh, many of my questions have been asked, but I just want to follow up on uh, the conversation uh, that was going on with um, Chairman Gibson on this. And that is, um, and particularly in my community, in my district, uh, the issue, and by the way, your team was very responsive um, and, and helpful, uh, but landlords, um, and I'm talking about mom and pop landlords, and um, Commissioner, you know, because you've been boots on the ground here in this community, um, we are, you know, post-World War II housing stock, three family houses, um, that many, uh, and I would have to venture, I guess, uh, probably predominantly owned by um, older senior citizens who have retired, and this happens to be their, their livelihood, and they exist on very small margins. And so when, of course, COVID hit, and, and you talk about those, um, Michael, um, landlords who were in trouble before COVID, I, my experience has been they, these were not um, landlords small business people, mom and pops, who were in trouble before COVID, but they lived on the margin. It was so close. Um, and they provided quality housing stock um, to families uh, in particularly. And what I'm seeing now is that they are not, uh, they're keeping second and third floors vacant um, because they've had such a problem. And, um, you know, as I said, this was the floodgate coming at the department. So I guess having heard, you know, the conversation uh, this morning, my question is, the program is going to be stood up on Monday, Michael? Is that what you yes. said? To us? Yes, Senator, um, my, Monday. Monday. And, and believe me, we have been waiting with on this for bated breath because um, it's, you know, it's been laborious. And so I guess I want to know, what are we going to be doing differently here on T-Rep than we did in the first round? Because we had these bottlenecks and then it was, you know, folks said to me, well, you know, um, tenants don't want to divulge this information. They feel that it is personal and intrusive. Um, and, you know, we were waiting because uh, tenants had to do the request and then we opened it up so that landlords could, but somehow we still weren't be, being able to move through, um, you know, those cases that were really urgent. And so what I've seen now is they've just taken their property off of the rental market, which is a huge problem. And, and also they are, you know, um, basically on the cliff in terms of, you know, meeting their their mortgage, their maintenance and, and upkeep. So um, I know there are lessons learned here. What are we gonna be doing differently starting on Monday? And is there going to be um, a rapid uh, process by which we can ep expedite this relief? Because they, they quite frankly feel like they've been invisible in terms of this discussion of you know, getting relief and having, you know, assistance reach them. 
Thank you, Senator Harley, for that question. And let me just, um, a, a, brief, a, a brief story of what happened with TRAP. You know what happened? We, in TRAP, we only had X amount of money and we wanted to make sure that the residents or the landlords received that, mon that money. We didn't have admin. So my staff, along with 40 people from Chafa, managed a, a process. We just stood up a, a, a process that was very uh, hands-on and no automated systems. So now we, because this resource uh, uh, we got from the federal government has admin resources, we have been able to actually hire uh, Don Parker as a director. Uh, Michael was doing not only his job, he was running trap in many of the other programs. So it was very overwhelming for, for my staff at the Department of Housing and at, at Chafa because they provided us with 40 people in addition to the DOH and the partners that we had in the community. With this new um, resource, we have actually hired three people already. Uh, Don, as a director, we have two project managers. We intend to hire another um, about eight other people to help. But the system that we also um, engaged um, provides that automated system that we did not have on track. There was a portal, but it was just a preliminary information that was put in there. Now we have a whole system that starts from the beginning to the end, even um, releasing the checks and or direct deposits. So it's, it's a totally different system. Um, and we, we understood what happened, but also I had to thank all the people that worked through that process because we were able to deploy um, a little over $26 million to the landlords. So yes, it's different. Uh, we, we can start taking applications in, in March. The landlords and the tenants both can apply. Informations come from different uh, ways, but that is all tied up together into that system. Well, thank you. I mean, I certainly, you know, being on the outside looking in, recognized, you know, the the tsunami that was upon the department. Um, I was unaware of the fact that in the first round that there was no latitude for administrative expenses, um, which kind of is counterintuitive uh, because you've got to run the program. In order to get the dollars out, you, you have to have the infrastructure. Um, so with the start of this scheduled for our Monday, do you have any metrics by which you're going to be assessing this rollout? You know, we should be getting X number by, you know, I don't know, 48 hours into it, 72 hours into it. I mean, is, are there any kind of, um, you know, goals that you're working against? So the system actually is going to provide us a dashboard that we every day we can see how many people can apply, how many people are in process, and then where are where are they in the process? The landlord or the tenant can go in and look at where they are also in the process. When once the application is in, um, they also need to put all the information that is required, and it's only those requirements by treasury that we have. We have not added any other requirements, but those that we do need to collect. Once an application is full, completed, embedded, uh, we are expecting that within five days, the checks or the direct deposit will be into a landlord's account. So we will be able to provide you with information um, right away, we, we can look at the system, we can see how many people are in the process, how many people are completing the applications and how many payments are gonna be deployed. We can look at regions and we can look at uh, the, the different, if some an application is stuck for more than five days, I mean, we can look at all those um, um, indicators, if you will. Uh, well, that's very encouraging. And so um, are we asking, um, or requiring the same amount of information for the applicants um, starting this second tranche as we did initially? Have we, I mean, were we asking previously, you know, questions that, for example, on a state level, we added to the process, to the application process? Well, we need uh, income verification. And we need to know that th this um, resources is dedicated to families and individuals that were affected by COVID as one of the certifications. But what we're doing, those certifications 
are, they can be signed automatically before people needed to complete a form and then upload them. Some of the certifications that they have to provide are there. Uh, the income verifications we do have to have, whether it is a 1040 or W2 that um, people have to upload. Uh, the system is pretty easy. Somebody's doing it on their, the application on their mobile. They can take a picture and it automatically goes into the system. So we're trying to make and be as flexible as we can. We also are providing, we have engaged our partners nonprofits that will be, some of them will be opening the doors that if a family or an individual do not have electronics or a computer, uh, they can go to their offices to complete uh, the application. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, I'll be um, I'll be very grateful for this uh, this second round. Thanks, uh, Commissioner and and Michael and 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 team. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you um, Senator. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for those questions, and thank you, Commissioner, for those answers. Um, do any other committee members have any other further questions? I'm checking. Okay. Well, um, Commissioner and, and, and staff, I, I think you have answered all of our questions. Um, thank you for coming on and, and being thorough. And um, thank you for all the work that you do and you're going to do going forth in the future. Thank you for being so accessible as well. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions, um, I hope you, Commissioner and your staff, everyone have a great day and have a great weekend. And again, thank you for coming before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everyone. Mr. Chairman, we've been joined by the Consumer Council and his team. Okay, we're on now. They are. Oh, okay. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Conservation Development um, Committee meeting. Thank you for coming on and um, for providing us with information. Um, I will give members a chance to get their notes together. We just got off the, of a call with the uh, Department of Housing. So we're um, switching gears right now. So one moment. Okay, thank you. And I'll ask members, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, signify by raising your hand. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any hands raised at this point in time. Um, so I will um, allow um, you start to uh, go ahead and, and um, provide information. Um, I, I will start off by introducing myself. How about, how about that? I am State Rep Bobby Gibson. <laughs> I'm chairing the, the committee meeting. Um, we have um, Vice Chair Hartley, um, not Vice Chair, sorry, Co-Chair, I apologize. Um, Senator Hartley on the line as well. Um, and so with that, being said, again, thank you and, and welcome for coming to our committee meeting. Uh, so I'll, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Richard Sobolewski. I'm the Acting Consumer Counsel. Um, with me today are Julie Datris. She's a staff attorney who works a lot in the energy field and does some water work as well. And also we have staff attorney, Bert Cohen, who is from the Office of State Broadband in our office and he's their policy coordinator. So that's the group I have today. Um, Attorney Cohen did a lot of the responses on um, that were related to broadband from the, from the last meeting or hearing. And I put together some of the normal questions about our, our budget and what was going on in our office for the last year and a half with people coming in and people coming and going and how some of our activities have been reduced due to COVID and basically to the vacancies. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, are there any questions or any comments from the committee members? Okay. 
Okay. Well, Richard, uh, I, I did pull up your um, report um, dated uh, March 12th. Um, is there anything in there that you would like to, to point out? Well, I think, you know, the, the whole broadband side is, is really developing as we go along. I know we had our hearing on the bill on Tuesday before the, the Energy and Technologies Committee. And I know the, the last hearing we had, the last meeting hearing we had in February with this, with the, with the regular appropriations committee, I know there were a lot of questions on broadband and I think the, other, the state agencies have a time to work together and put together a much better coordinated effort of what was in the bill and get information to, to, this, to this committee and also to energy and technologies. Um, maybe maybe Bert could add something about um, broadband. I'd be happy to, thanks Rich. Uh, Good morning, co-chairs, Representative Gibson and Senator Hartley and the rest of the uh, members of uh, this working group. Uh, as uh, uh, Rich said, I'm Burke Cohen. I am the, uh, uh, I am a staff attorney by title, but I serve as the uh, state's broadband policy coordinator. Um, just, uh, for the record, um, I uh, started on uh, May 8th. Uh, I had many years in private practice at a, a fairly large law firm. And I have to say that I have been uh, quite impressed with the uh, uh, work of the, uh, my colleagues here at the Office of Consumer Counsel. Um, I haven't been in uh, a public agency uh, since before I went to law school. So um, um, we have a group here that is uh, flat out. We handle the uh, same amount of cases that Pura puts out. We're in all of their cases with probably a tenth of the staff that Pura has, maybe even less. So... Um, on uh, moving to the broadband side, let me just say that um, uh, entering the office on May 8th in the uh, right in the uh, midst of the early, the first era of our period of the pandemic, uh, it has been nonstop. I, uh, in addition to doing uh, uh, legal work uh, and working with the Office of the Governor and OPM, on various issues. I can tell you that uh, the calls are coming in, the calls and emails from uh, consumers, from municipalities, from businesses, from people living outside the state uh, who uh, get my number from our website and are asking questions about uh, levels of broadband service in the state. Uh, to help them uh, decide where they want to live because these people are moving from New York City and uh, their uh, broadband uh, internet needs are uh, fairly extensive. So we are quite busy. Uh, we have uh, federal funding coming in that is going to uh, <coughs> increase the work of the, uh, of the office. Unfortunately, none of that money is coming for staffing for our office, but we are funded, as you know, from the uh, OCC uh, Public Utility Commission uh, fund, and uh, that's assessed to the companies that are uh, regulated uh, by Pura. So, um, but having said that, um, uh, we have programs like the emergency broadband benefit that are coming out now for low-income people. Um, and we, uh, I'm being a one-man shop, I can barely have the time to uh, do what I have to do and then work to promote that, uh, doing reach out to social service agencies and other people who work with uh, low-income communities to make sure that their constituents are aware of that. So we appreciate the committee's uh, support in our very modest proposal of just uh, increasing uh, our office by two people uh, strictly to handle 
uh, broadband matters. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, the broadband office, broadband, or <laughs> anything else that you have related to our, uh, our budget. Thank you, Burton. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that answer. Uh, I see that Senator Hartley, you have your hand raised. Hi, Senator. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman Gibson. Um, and good morning um, to uh, Rich and staff. Thanks for being here. Um, it, help me out if you've already provided this to us, because we've got a 14% increase here. It's strictly um, uh, personnel. It's the PS line. Um, it's the attorney and then the, the examiner. Um, because this, as we know, existed um, in the budget, but was flatlined, not funded. Um, so, so now this is, you know, finally, I guess, standing up this division. Um, it, and I, unfortunately, because we're all down these rabbit holes, was unable to um, have the benefit of the public hearing, I guess, which was pretty robust um, this week. Uh, but I'm trying to uh, kind of uh, catch up on this issue because it's uh, so, so crucial. Is there a mapping that we have, um, a statewide mapping of our um, broadband capacities? Um, I'll take that, uh, uh, Senator Hartley. Uh, yes, the, uh, broad, the governor's broadband bill does have uh, a, a very uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it has a section on mapping. The mapping will be done uh, by OPM. Uh, our office will be working with OPM on that and uh, hopefully with the providers. Um, and we expect that mapping to be uh, extremely granular uh, to meet the needs of not just of the residents of the state, but also uh, to help businesses, uh, particularly uh, uh, data centers, as the governor's uh, uh, very interested in, and uh, other businesses to make sure that they know what their uh, our broadband capabilities are wherever they want to locate. But that mapping shows what exists now and then what is contemplated. Is that what you're telling me, Bert? Well, uh, uh, Senator Hartley, the way it's set up, it... it it's, it's not an instantaneous thing. We have to get the data, OPM has to, uh, and we have to get the data and, and put it into the system. Uh, and it's gonna come through various uh, data sets. Uh, so the idea is to determine the best approach to that uh, in consult, uh, OPM in consultation with our office and DECD and uh, some other agencies. And the idea is to make sure that we get the correct data sets, report that to the governor, and then uh, uh, beginning in January of 2022, uh, start that process. Okay. But the reason uh, what I'm trying to understand is uh, uh, I'm recalling that there was some kind of a report that was put out. And I believe it may have been from the industry, which talked about the fact that Connecticut, um, comparatively speaking, was um, you know, in the forefront of providing connectivity. Um, and so once again, there was an industry report. So that's why I'm interested in what exists now, because maybe you want to comment on this, but um, you know, the, the, um, the description that I have heard most frequently is that um, can, can we have connectivity, um, good connectivity in the state. It just depends whether or not you want or you have the ability to pay for it. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. Um, there's several uh, components to uh, let's just call the general topic of the digital divide. The first is uh, availability. Um, and uh, right now we know that there's a percentage of our population that does not have access uh, to uh, robust broadband or any broadband for that matter. 
um, using the industry's data, which frankly, and I've said this on the record uh, at, the, at the EMT hearing on the broadband bill, it's flawed. And uh, uh, the OPM mapping uh, witness explained why that was flawed. It was based on flawed self-reported data uh, that indicated that if uh, a, a, a provider had a, was able to a- access to uh, residences in a census block, the whole census block was deemed uh, served. So, uh, but notwithstanding, as Senator Hartley, if uh, using the industry's number of 98% connected, which I don't agree with and don't believe, but even using that based on uh, Connecticut's data of 1.5 million households, that means that 30,000 households uh, do not currently have the ability to even have any uh, real internet access. And uh, my, my suspicion is that we'll find out that there will be, that will be increased. Uh, that number is larger than that. Notwithstanding, uh, but I just, so there's that issue, there's the uh, affordability issue, and then there's the adoption issue. The adoption is if you have the, con- the ability to connect and you have the money to pay for uh, internet, uh, whether it's on your own or through uh, a program that's coming up like the emergency uh, broadband benefit program, then are you willing to, do you have a resistance to getting online because uh, you're undocumented or you're um, uh, afraid uh, you have uh, uh, a feeling that the government's going to track what you're doing or uh, you have a fear of the internet, afraid of fraud, scams, etc. So there's, those are the three elements of, of the willingness to do that. Um, as we indicate in our uh, answer to, I, probably I think with some of your questions, Senator Hartley, which were good questions, uh, we gave, uh, we submitted a detailed breakdown of uh, sources of federal broadband funding. Uh, again, there's $300 million that was allocated under the uh, uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act at the end of December uh, 2020 uh, that the uh, National Telecommunications and Information Administration, that's part of the Department of Commerce, is going to allocate amongst the states. Uh, my hope is, and what I've advocated uh, before that agency, is that they split it uh, equally amongst the 50 states and that we as a state decide what our share of the 6 million will be used for. In addition, uh, under the uh, 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 America Recovers Act, uh, money that's allocated to the states and municipalities may also be used for broadband extension, ex- uh, expansion, excuse me. And uh, in addition, uh, um, uh, this week a bill was introduced uh, by uh, Senator Klobuchar and Representative Clyburn uh, that will provide, uh, I think it's $94, $96 billion uh, to address getting the rest of the country uh, built out. Um, while uh, things are very bipartisan in Washington, D.C., broadband seems to be pretty much a bipartisan issue. Obviously, who gets the most money uh, is another story. Connecticut, historically, has not done very well in getting federal funding on that. So in any event, um, but I do want to go back to one thing on your, on, before I conclude, Senator Hartley, on, on the mapping and the funding. The one thing that we've learned, or that I've learned in uh, listening to national broadband leaders since I've been in this job is that the biggest mistake a state uh, can make is holding off on taking action to ensure connectivity until a map is done. If you wait till you have all the data, it's never going to get done. And the real answer is that with the federal funding, with the pandemic, and with the political climate, 
if, if we're ever going to get universal connectivity in the state of Connecticut, now's the time. Thank you. Thank you. That. And just lastly, if I might, what do you see the role going forward of the CEN? CEN, uh, CEN is, is, is a, a, a tremendous asset. And here's where I see CEN. Um, CEN does obviously it, 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 it serves government offices, uh, local municipal offices, schools, libraries, uh, though, and I, I believe in a few cases, perhaps uh, uh, it connects to some businesses, um, but it is not an end user uh, delivered network uh, for residential customers. Where it, where it can help and, and play a major role uh, uh, over the next coming years is its availability and its potential as what's called a middle mile transport. Um, so that, let's just say for instance, a uh, 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 municipality wants to build its own network. CEN could provide the, the internet broadband service to the neighborhood. Uh, and then it's up to the municipality to then connect to the residents. Um, we, uh, CEN would offer, also offer that to private uh, companies, uh, but typically, uh, based on my experience in talking to uh, the director of CEN, uh, let's use Comcast as an example, they want their own network. They don't want to uh, piggyback onto uh, someone else's uh, network for uh, whatever reasons, I'm not going to speculate. But yes, they are available for a, long, for a middle mile transport role uh, to assist in competitive uh, broadband services. Uh, uh, Bert, one last thing. Can you tell me what the org chart is like for CEN? It, it, are they under the Office of Broadband? Where, where do they fit in this uh, org chart? That's... <laughs> Um, I'd like, that's a good question. Um, I, I believe that they are under uh, either DAS or UConn, Senator Harley. Um, is that where we'd see it in the budget? Um, whew, that is a great question. Um, I'll, I, I think OPM may be a better source for that uh, uh, That particular uh, question. So Anthony, um, are you with us? Um, he's our OFA. Yes, I am. Do, do you have Hi, any? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm taking notes now. We'll uh, follow up shortly with an answer to that question. Uh, okay, so where CES fits in the budget, CN. We, yeah, where where is that? So we, we, you know, and it's still funded, I'm assuming. And, you know, what are, what are the personnel, uh, the PS that are associated with that? Um, th thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hartley. And uh, thank you, Bert, for those, uh, those answers. Uh, the next hand up was Senator Olson. Senator, hi. Um, hi, how are you? Um, I have one question when, uh, and I'm not certain if uh, Senator Hartley's uh, questions got to this point. I apologize. I'm listening to a couple of different Zooms at the same time. Um, CEN had um, uh, a uh, broadband access to a variety of uh, municipal and boards of ed. Did you get into this, uh, Joan? Uh, no, no. My understanding is part of that laying that, that down um, was there was a part of that that said, we're, we're going to lay these wires down. We're going to connect municipal and fire departments and boards of ed. And there is going to be a section that's available for private, for the, uh, for private businesses to latch in quotes, latch on to in uh, expand broadband. Is there anybody looking at the wire that we've already laid in the ground to expand broadband? 
Um, I, I'll assume, uh, Senator Austin, that's uh, that question is directed to me. Uh, I am not of it. I, I am not aware presently. I do know that uh, CN has worked with some of the other. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't want to speculate. So if we Senator, could check but, into that component of it, because that's my understanding. And then if we could take advantage of what we've already put in the ground, already worked on and, and expand upon it, we could get far uh, farther than where we are today. So I just wanna look at that component of it and see if the mapping that OPM is going to do is uh, going to include what we've already done, uh, right. that we put millions and millions of dollars into. We should do. We should use that system and 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 uh, figure out what we're going to do. So I just want to point that out, and if we could look at that and find out if the mapping is going to include that, I, I would be so appreciative. Okay, sure. I can. Uh, uh, I, I don't think you've heard OPM yet on the uh, on the second round here. So I will I will uh, let them know that you're interested in that point, and uh, because they are going to be managing the mapping component of the broadband bill. So that's a-, a, a Thank you very much. Question. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Um, I did see Senator, uh, Representative Walker's hand was up, but it went back down. Representative Walker, do you have a question? Uh, no, I, I realize that I need to, to direct that question to OPM. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, ma'am. Okay, so I, I do have a, a, a another a question myself, and um, maybe you guys can help me to help me to understand it. So I see that in the America Recovery Act, um, 7.6 million is being given to help um, with the homework gap. Um, and so I understand these monies are being provided, um, but as far as underserved communities and houses, you know, one of you guys mentioned the number of houses without. Um, internet access. Um, outside of just saying that the money is being given, could someone elaborate on what specific steps are going to be taken to make sure that these underserved communities actually get access? Sure, I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer that. Um, what is, uh, while well, the American Recovery Act, uh, I believe the, the school connectivity uh, part of it that is uh, another component of what Governor Lamont uh, uh, initiative for uh, uh, remote learning, which was uh, 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 which is ongoing for this school year. It's called the Everyone Learns Initiative, where I believe uh, there was uh, over forty million dollars that was dedicated to buying devices. Uh, for uh, low-income students who will, did not have access to uh, equipment to in, uh, access the internet, in addition to buying uh, uh, basic broadband service for each of those students. Um, and that, that was accomplished this year. My sense is that, uh, again, I haven't studied this. I'm going to a, a seminar this afternoon on the American Recovery Act, so they to get more information. But my understanding is that a lot of that money is also along the same lines. Uh, the the problem that uh, Connecticut has in terms of uh, federal dollars uh, being allocated is that we need to make sure that we get our fair share of that money. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, and I'm not dodging, I want to go back to the, uh, to the urban uh, low-income uh, areas, but uh, the problem is that a lot of Connecticut is not considered uh, rural, and a lot of the money, particularly under uh, the previous administration, went to went to red states um, that were more rural in nature. And states like Connecticut, uh, uh, I mean, to the extent we were able to get funding, was not adequate to close the gap. And what I've always advocated, uh, and I have a there's a number of people that I am in contact with on almost a daily basis is 
get the money to Connecticut, to a state, to us, and let us be the ones to decide how to spend that money, where to spend it, uh, and who to make sure, because we're closer to the uh, we're closer to the problems and we know the issues as opposed to the federal, some bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I know they're hardworking. Right? I'm not taking anything away from the people in D.C. Who, who, who are committed to working on these issues, but they just don't know what's going on uh, on the ground. Uh, with, respect to, uh, let's, with respect to the urban areas, um, Historically, the urban areas, uh, and I'm thinking mostly of the cable industry, but most of those ir urban areas were built out uh, very early. Uh, uh, they were built out in the, uh, let's figure in the period from 1975 to 1985. Um, so a lot of the issue that, uh, and I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer, but a lot of the issues that I perceive that occur there with respect to connectivity is the possibility of a lot of that. Some of those uh, connections and some of the infrastructure there um, may be, um, how should we put it, less robust because they're, they were served first under uh, what was then the DPUC's build-out rules for cable companies. Um, that's number one. Number two is there are uh, large, uh, larger uh, multiple dwelling unit complexes uh, that may be more difficult to serve uh, um, uh, and to upgrade. Uh, in, our, uh, in, the, in the governor's bill, there's a proposal uh, to make sure that broadband uh, uh, internet access providers have the same level of mandatory access uh, to what we call MDUs, as do cable companies. Um, so um, what we're really interested in and what I'm personally interested in, sir, is making sure that the mapping component that we have in the state actually drills down to the address, to the property, so that we can diagnose exactly what the, where there might be insufficient connectivity in, uh, in, uh, in larger areas and in uh, uh, poorer communities. And I'm also, can I just say one other thing? Cause I want to talk about affordability and I just want to tell you, this is why we desperately need, we need more than two people. I'm going to be frank with you, but we're not, we understand the way things are. But right now we have this emergency broadband benefit program, $50 uh, a monthly subsidy uh, for internet access uh, to qualifying low income households. And I don't have anyone to help me get that word out. I've got to do this all myself in addition to testifying here, testifying before ENT, working with the governor's office, handling the complaints. We need help to be able to manage all of these federal programs and to help facilitate them. I myself, in my spare time, am reaching out uh, to social service agencies, to legal services, to anybody who services uh, low-income communities, to tell them I'm going to get you information on this emergency broadband benefit. Can you please, please get the word out so we make sure that eligible Connecticut residents get access to the federal funding. We need to get our share of that and make sure that our people uh, are not uh, 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 hampered by affordability issues. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I kind of, I kind of probably gave you a little bit more, but I feel passionately about this, sir. I just well, want you. To... I, well, thank you, Bert. I, I do too, because actually, you know, I, I work in a school, and so, um, you know, the the homework gap is real. Um, students' access to the to the internet, there, it is it is not um, equitable, 
And so, um, and even with the devices that are being given out, you know, my, my question is, you know, these devices, they get broken, um, these devices, um, how strong are they? Um, you know, and I know it goes hand in hand also with, with um, the achievement gap. You know, Connecticut has one of the largest achievement gaps in the nation. So this whole thing about broadband and internet access, is, it, it is real and something that really needs to be addressed. I, I, I'm glad you're going to your workshop this afternoon. Um, so I hope that works and, and maybe something, maybe some other things you can share with us. But, um, and also thank you for saying that you guys need help. I mean, you, are you talking about, you said you're talking about staffing, Bert? Yes, sir. I am, I am, a, I am a broadband office, a state broadband office of one. And in the bill, what you'll see is there are, um, uh, I don't want to characterize it, uh, but there are levels, a uh, lot more resources being given to uh, the regulatory bodies, uh, not the people who are gonna help uh, directly deal with consumer issues like our office does. In fact, frankly, I mean, who knows where the bill is gonna wind up, uh, you know, what's gonna be in the bill. Um, I have some ideas if uh, there are changes about digital equity, uh, 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 concepts to add into the bill. We're also doing digital equity and I'm doing that on my own as well right now too. So um, uh, I, my hope, is, I really would like uh, 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 my, uh, uh, my boss, uh, Mr. Sobolewski may not like this, but I, I know we've already talked about it. I would much prefer that the consumer complaints came to our office because right now, if a consumer complaints comes to a legislator, comes to Pura, comes to Deep, comes to the governor's office, where do you think those consumer complaints wind up? We take them. So um, we know we know the, the the providers. We know the groundwork. I'd almost rather have a, a person allocated to our office put a, 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 a toll-free number in there for any consumers and have us work through the process with them and help them. But uh, in any event, I don't write the legislation. That's the governor's bill. So, um, but uh, my, my focus, uh, uh, my office staff, our, uh, our office staff has suffered because I was, when I came in, I was going to be uh, a staff attorney who part-time handled broadband and worked with uh, attorney doctors who's on the line and uh, worked with Rich and the other attorneys in our office on, on uh, pure cases. I don't have time to do that um, uh, because right now we are in an, this is an emergency. And, and you all know that. I, I listened a little bit to uh, your previous discussion with the commission. This is with the other department. This is a, a true emergency. And if you do not have access to broadband, uh, uh, and I'd love to talk to you about this maybe after the session and we can, you know, I can get your personal thoughts or any time, but I know you're very busy right now. But this telehealth, there's, uh, I can't imagine applying for unemployment benefits on your, uh, on your mobile device. Good luck trying that. Uh, you need to have a wireline connection to survive uh, not, and to thrive in today's society. And uh, we, we want to do everything we can to make that happen in the state of Connecticut, sir. Thank you, Bert. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your honesty, because um, it's, it's very true. Um, we have to do better. I mean, even um, accessing the VAM system for to get your, your vaccination. Um, imagine doing that on your phone. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, and, and thank you for your answer. And um, yes, it'll be great to have a conversation um, when things slow down a little bit. But thank you so much. Oh, oh, one more thing, Bert. Your request, is it possible for yourself or, or Rich to put that in writing and send it to us? Sure. I, 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 can I just, I probably shouldn't say this online, but I mean, the governor is going to be assessing 
what happened in the hearing um, uh, uh, and what uh, what the next steps are with the legislation before the E&T e committee uh, JFs the bill. Um, so um, if you can give me a, a, I don't know what your time period is, but if you can give us a week to, before we do that, that would be very helpful because we do have some discussions coming up uh, over the next week, but I'll be happy to do that. Thank you so much. That'll be fine. Uh, th and thank you, thank you again. Senator Hart, use your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Gibson. Uh, just one question, um, not to belabor this, but when we were just uh, recently doing the, uh, the data center bills, uh, there was this discussion that there is a um, corridor of fiber uh, that runs on, along I-95 connecting uh, can, uh, New York through Connecticut to Boston. Can you comment on that? Um, I believe there is. Um, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it, uh, it's either in AT&T or, or Verizon, I believe, but uh, um, I'm aware of that. There's also fiber. Senator Hurley, there's fiber in places that we don't, we don't know. Eversource has a fiber network. There are a number of fiber networks out there that are um, uh, that are available. But yes, my understanding is that uh, uh, there is a, a fiber run that goes from uh, New York to uh, Boston. Okay, I guess that's why we're all so anxious on this mapping, huh? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And again, two components to it. Number one is knowing where the infrastructure is. And, and, and some of that we probably would have to get on a confidential basis separate apart from what we would make available to consumers because to follow up on, on, on Representative Gibson's questions, we want to make sure that if you're a consumer, you can plug in your address and get all the data that you need. I mean, technically you can do that now, but we don't have any control over where that the data inputs are that are into the mapping. And so uh, on, on some of the mapping, the uh, nationally available mapping that I've looked at, uh, I don't have the confidence that, that, er that uh, some of the data that's inputted into that is accurate. So we want to make sure that we have accuracy with respect to uh, uh, business and residential information and also accuracy with respect to infrastructure. Sometimes the infrastructure, frankly, is hard to get information because the uh, providers uh, and the owners of that infrastructure uh, feel that that's proprietary, but usually that runs along the, uh, the right of way of the, uh, of, of the state. So we, we definitely, if we don't have that information uh, at, in, at DOT or somewhere, we should be able to get it. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Senator Hartley, for those questions. And uh, thank you, Brent, for all your answers. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the committee, are there any other members who have any other questions? Well, seeing none, uh, thank you again for, for coming on. Um, your information was was quite informative, we really appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you for providing us with the information going forward uh, when you get a chance to put it together. Um, this is a very uh, important and, and serious topic um, that you know, um, you know, some of us don't think about because of our, uh, our situation, but um, there's those of us who are not as fortunate who really need um, this type of help. So thank you for the work that you do and thank you for coming on this morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day and have a great week. Thanks. Great week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Susan. Are we ready?
We are the team from the Agricultural Experiment Station is uh, with us. Thank you, Susan. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. I, I will um, just give members a, a, a chance to uh, get their notes together, their thoughts uh, as we transition. But as I do that, I will do some introductions. I am State Rep Bobby Gibson, um, co-chair of the um, Conservation Development Subcommittee. I have here also my co-chair, Senator Hartley. And uh, I believe we have on the, on the Zoom um, uh, ranking members. Uh, uh, Ferraro, I think I saw you, uh, Representative. And uh, I didn't see Senator Summers, but um, I would like to acknowledge her as well. Okay. Um, we'll get right into it. Uh, so I will give um, you guys a chance to go ahead um, and provide us with information. And thank you for coming and joining our committee this morning. Great. Thank you, uh, Representative. Um, our director, Dr. Jason White, is on the call. He may just want to say a few uh, remarks, then we can get right into our budget and uh, answer any questions you might have. Good morning, my name is Jason White. I'm the, the director of the Ag Experiment Station. I um, took over um, last April. Um, so um, we're uh, anxious to answer any questions you may have about our budget. Um, I asked Dr. Phil Armstrong um, to join us. He runs our mosquito surveillance and virus program, um, just in case there are any specific questions related to that. Um, and also Mike Last, our, our CFO is, is available as well. Representative, would you like me to just go over a, uh, a brief um, overview of our, our budget as it stands, the way the governor recommended it? I, I was muted, I apologize. Yes, please do so, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, in the governor's uh, recommended budget, there was uh, an additional $150,000 uh, for 16 trapping sites for the mosquito uh, surveillance and testing program in Eastern Connecticut. Uh, there was also a reduction for annualized savings from last fiscal year of 64,000. Um, and there's also, we also wanna talk about the cannabis bill, the recreational marijuana, um, where there is interest by the Department of Consumer Protection to transfer three positions and some funding to the Agricultural Experiment Station uh, for the regulatory testing uh, for that program. And everything else is, is pretty much uh, okay. We, we do have one position that's added in that Mosquito $150,000 um, option that was recommended by the governor. Uh, currently, we have 70 authorized positions. Uh, 62 of those positions are filled, eight are vacant. Uh, the eight vacant positions are not funded at this point. Uh, and the, there is a proposal to move three positions uh, into our budget from the governor's recommended budget in the Consumer Protection Agency to, to us for that program. Uh, with the big retirement uh, concern, I, I think everybody would want to know about 26% of our agency is eligible for the uh, retirement in fiscal year uh, 2022. Uh, we have 100 employees, so we'd be looking at, uh, we could lose as many as, as 26. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk around the agency. We just haven't gotten any um, official uh, notification that anybody is going to actually retire, but we suspect uh, although it might not be the, the 26 positions, it may be, uh, you know, near 20. Thank you. Are there any questions from the members? Okay, I have a, a, a comment. You just made, just brought something to my attention, or just a thought. Um, with the upcoming um, mosquito season, I know you mentioned a budget for that. 
Um, do we anticipate um, any increases due to any type of weather conditions or um, anything the pandemic may um, have caused um, as far as um, people not being outside or at different venues and mosquitoes maybe um, uh, growing in population? Is anything, is any, any concerns of that nature? Yeah, oh, I can, answer that? sure, I can speak to that. Um, so um, yeah, we, I run the mosquito trapping and testing program and we have uh, expanded our program this year and that is the request for the additional uh, funding that's in the governor's budget. Um, and really this is for increased monitoring in Eastern Connecticut for Eastern equine encephalitis virus. In 2019, we had a large outbreak of the disease. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly rare disease, but it is um, highly lethal, has a high case fatality rate, and uh, the survivors often have permanent neurological damage. So it's a very devastating illness. And um, during that outbreak, we had uh, four human cases, three fatalities, uh, a number of horse cases, those were all fatal as well. Um, and so what we're seeing in the Northeastern US is we are seeing a pattern of increased Tripoli virus activity throughout the region. It's not just affecting us, it's affecting our neighboring states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey. And uh, some of this is, it's, it's complex. We don't really fully understand why we're seeing more virus activity than in uh, years past, but it is likely linked to uh, certainly these, this is a, a weather sensitive system. And, um, and we do see periodic outbreaks, particularly with during periods of increased rainfall and during warmer temperatures, which uh, help accelerate mosquito development in these swamp habitats where we see Triple E virus. Um, we're also monitoring for West Nile virus and we see that every year. And all these diseases are very cyclical and heavily um, sensitive to weather conditions, environmental conditions. And so, um, yes, I mean, I think we do anticipate more um, uh, activity d due to uh, mosquito-borne diseases going forward. And so the uh, increased funding will really help plug some of the gaps in our mosquito surveillance network. This is really an early warning system that allows us to get ahead of the curve and um, look at risk by trapping and testing mosquitoes, which are the source of human infection. And um, we work very closely with state agencies, with Department of Public Health, Department of Environmental Energy and Environmental Protection, and Department of Agriculture, as well as um, local health districts as well. And so all this information is used to mount uh, prevention and control um, uh, measures uh, to mitigate the um, impact of these diseases. Thank you for the answer, Phil. I appreciate it. Well, that was a long answer. I don't know if I answered your question, but the, the bottom line is, yes, we are seeing more uh, virus activity, uh, particularly in recent years, we, our first human case of Triple E virus was recorded in 2013. Uh, it was a single fatality in Eastern Connecticut and Killingly. And then uh, in 2019, we had that outbreak uh, where we had a, a cluster of human cases for the first time. So this is, uh, I think, something that's new that we're seeing with Triple E virus. And of course, West Nile virus is also a, a new threat you know, and since it was introduced in the New York City area. Wow, it just keeps getting better, huh? Yeah, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um. <laughs> so, so with all this, with the viruses and um, with the uh, expected um, um, change in employment, you guys uh, are gonna have a, a big task this year, right? Oh, uh, we will. Yes, so we're going to be trapping, we plan to be trapping at 108 sites statewide um, and monitoring uh, for the risk of, of these diseases. So yeah, it's a big task. <laughs>
Okay, well, well, thank you for that. And um, hopefully we can support you as much as we can. Um, I, I would have to let everyone know and my members and, and our guests, thank you. But uh, at this point in time, I, I work in a school. And so we're about to have a fire drill. Um, please don't tell the students, they don't know. <laughs> so I have to transition to my other job and get, get on my, 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 uh, to my station. But uh, from me to you, thank you for coming out today and sharing this information. Um, is, is, is very beneficial. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend. But at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to my very more than capable colleague, Senator Hartley. And thank you, Senator, for um, taking over the duties. I really appreciate it. And um, everyone have a great weekend. And again, everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Rep. Gibson. We will be missing you, um, but uh, keep those kids in line in the fire drill. I know what that's like. <laughs> And it's no a nice talking. day. <laughs> no talking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and so I think Senator Austin had a hand raised. Um, Senator Austin. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I, I know about the Tripoli. Um, I'm also curious about um, tick-borne um, illnesses that are happening. I think that they're, they, they have not uh, um, been abated at all. I think about it today because I was outside already a couple of times this morning and uh, came in with a tick on me, one of the little ones. Um, are, is there work being done uh, with your agency revolving around ticks and uh, the process that we're uh, using to take care of ticks? I'll, I'll start off and uh, address some of those and then Phil can chime in and cor you know correct anything I uh, misspeak on. But yes, um, so we have... Um, both uh, an active and a passive tick surveillance program. Uh, the passive is uh, when ticks are brought to us either by citizens or through public health districts. And then um, this will be, I think our second year where we have an active program where we have set um, sites similar to the mosquito um, virus surveillance program. Uh, and then from all of those, um, from the active ticks, we, we isolate viruses from the passive program it's, it's if they're engorged. Uh, and then in, this, in addition to that, we do have a research program. We have a number of scientists working on tick-borne uh, related diseases as part of our um, CDC Center of Excellence. Um, so Phil, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I don't specifically work on ticks, but I, you know, we have other um, scientists here that work specifically on ticks. And um, yeah, so we do have the two surveillance programs. We have a very um, active and uh, uh, comprehensive research program on, um, particularly on evaluating um, um, vector control, tick control measures to um, help uh, uh, to help reduce the risk of tick-borne illnesses. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on. Um, surveillance and trying to map, develop risk maps to really understand uh, the environmental risk posed by ticks uh, in, the, uh, in the state. Uh, it is interesting in the US or in the Northeastern US, particularly here in Connecticut, we're seeing new human biting tick species that are in, uh, moving northward into our um, climatic zone. So there's one tick species called the Lone Star Tick which is found in the southeastern US. It transmits a pathogen called ehrlichiosis. Uh, and that's something that we're just starting to see creep into Connecticut. Uh, there are established populations in a few parts of Southern Connecticut. Uh, there's also the Asian longhorn tick, which is a new invasive species that was brought over and first discovered in New Jersey and is now found um, in many uh, Eastern US uh, states. And we don't really know what the public health significance is of this tick species, but that's something we're monitoring and we really wanna understand its, its uh, uh, distribution here in the state and what pathogens it might be carrying. So those are some of the um, things that we're um, working on, as well as of course, there's the black-legged tick, which transmits Lyme disease and a number of other human pathogens. And that's uh, uh, something that we're also continuing to um, monitor and um, working on developing uh, better techniques to combat the tick. So, yes. So my understanding is that 
um, those that might end up with a tick bite don't necessarily, that many times you don't see the, um, that, uh, that doctors are not necessarily testing for uh, tick-borne diseases as uh, sort of rapidly as they might. Is there a, a recommendation that you would make to physicians uh, relative to tick bites or tick diseases? Yeah, I'm not a clinician. Um, so I sort of leave that to the physician. Um, okay. But to make that judgment, I'm not really involved in those kinds of um, questions. Um, but we do have a tick testing lab. So, um, so ticks can be submitted to us by Connecticut residents uh, for testing or pathogen testing. So that's one option. Um, Are they alive when they when you test them or so when you yeah, get them? Uh, they're alive or dead. It doesn't matter. We can still test them either way. Okay. And the first thing we'll do is we'll look at the tick species, identify the species, make sure it's uh, an import, you know, see whether it's uh, a tick that's of concern. And, uh, and if it's fed long enough, if it's clearly um, looks like it's been on the, and, and actually started to, to feed on the person, they will test it for a number of tick-borne pathogens that, we, that occur here. So, so do you have a sheet, a worksheet, kind of on the different ticks that are in Connecticut right now that we could put out to constituents? You know, I don't, yeah, I'm sure we do. I would have to put you in touch with uh, Kirby Stafford or Goudars Molay, some of the individuals that work on ticks and tick species per se. But yes, we have a lot of good resources on that um, uh, and on what the different tick species are. There is a, um, there's a whole manual we put out on tick-borne okay. diseases and I can get that to you. That would be great. Uh, my last question would be, um, uh, my understanding is that there's um, been money put in the bonding to complete um, or to start, I, I suppose complete is the wrong term, uh, the uh, uh, rehabilitation and renovation of the uh, experiment station. Um, is that your understanding also? Yeah, um, I'll let Mike uh, last address that question. This is for our Valley Laboratory up in, up in Windsor, not our yes. New Haven facility. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, there was in, in 2015, uh, then Governor Malloy uh, had recommended $11.5 million uh, and the legislature approved that. Uh, once we got into the schematic design phase, it turned out uh, because the project had been delayed for a number of reasons that the cost escalation uh, brought the cost up to $17.8 million. So uh, Governor Lamont in his budget is recommending an additional 6.3 million uh, in capital funds uh, to allow us to uh, get back into the design phase and move that project forward. And we're hoping that uh, this summer uh, with the legislature's approval that we can uh, put that project out to bid and, and begin it. It's, it's a much, much needed project. Great, thank you. I appreciate it and I certainly agree with that. And um, I guess my, my I, I apologize, I thought that was my last question. Uh, do you do any uh, work revolving around diseases that move from animals into uh, humans uh, relative to possible pandemics? Um, other than, other than our, our tick-borne and, and mosquito virus programs, I, I think um, those would be the only, only ones we have. Is that correct? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we're really working with vector-borne diseases, so things okay. transmitted by either ticks or mosquitoes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Austin. Uh, I do not see any other raised hands, but I just would like to um, follow up a little bit on the tick conversation um, with Senator Austin. So in view of climate changes, um, as you have indicated, you know, are um, central to uh, the uh, Tripoli and, and the West Nile. Is that also going to be indicative of an increased uh, tick population 
um, in addition to the fact that we now have these um, new uh, species with us? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the state is pretty much saturated with, or pretty close to being saturated with um, the, the deer tick or the black-legged tick, which is the main vector of Lyme disease. I don't, I don't know that climate change per se is going to, um, how that will change the risk of these very complex ecosystems. It's hard to predict, but I can definitely say with species where we're kind of at the northern limit of its current range. So the tick species like the Lone Star tick, especially, will likely get worse going forward. Um, and uh, it much. transmits other pathogens as well. Um, so the Lone Star tick transmits uh, Ehrlichia and another, there's two viruses it transmits called, one's called Bourbon virus and the other virus is um, Heartland virus. So it's also a disease vector as well. So we may have two tick species, um, two disease vectors where we to deal with. Um, with uh, climate change and range expansion of, of some of these species. Um, and so, uh, Doctor, uh, you know, from time to time, I, I get asked, uh, there are these commercial services out there that, you know, talk about um, doing uh, prophylactic spraying and that kind of thing. Are those valuable? Do those help? Are they... Yeah, that uh, um, depends what you're spraying with, um, and um, again, I'm I'm not I'm getting a little outside of my field of study. Um, Kirby would be the guy to talk to about this because he evaluates um, insecticides and other tick control products that are out there. Uh, my understanding is some of them are quite effective, some of them are less. Um, less so. Um, and uh, so it's hard to generalize, um, but it will temporarily knock down the ticks, um, but it won't result in a, a lasting change, in, you know, in terms of uh, tick-borne diseases. And you're only um, affecting the, the, the immediate sort of treatment area. So it's not a um, long-term solution, but it certainly has its place if you want to reduce the risk for a, let's say you have a large outdoor event and you want to spray the property or your area to prevent, you know, people from, from uh, picking up ticks, uh, it will have a temporary uh, effect. And, and the same is, uh, true also for mosquitoes because they do um, also have those kinds of services. Yeah, so they're, yeah, it's very temporary. It's even more temporary with mosquitoes because <laughs> they, yeah. they will fly right back in and reinvade the treated area. But yeah, there are a number of products out there, so they do work, um, but they are very temporary. And uh, with, with mosquitoes, it may even be just for a few days, you can uh, spray the property. There's a barrier spray that will, um, it's intended to kind of reduce um, new mosquitoes from, from invading your property and protecting that treatment zone. But um, the reality is, yes, they're very, um, you know, temporary and, and, and at best. And really, you know, the things that we recommend uh, and really the first line of defense for reducing your exposure to mosquitoes or ticks is personal protection measures. Those things have real demonstrated impact and are things that you can do by things like wearing a repellent um, reducing your exposure at dusk and dawn when the mosquitoes are most active. If you're, you know, working in the yard, tuck your pant legs, your socks over your pant legs and spray 
treat your clothing with a um, permethrin or, or a, um, uh, a repellent that will um, deter ticks from, from biting you. Um, so there are, a lot, there are a whole series of things that people can do um, short of environmental spraying <laughs> yeah. uh, that are probably more, you know, are more effective ultimately. Um, we do spray, you know, it's spraying to do, uh, at least for, I can speak from the mosquito control side of things, um, you know, aerial spraying or area wide spraying is a very temporary remedy and it still doesn't change our bottom line, our basic public health measures, uh, personal protection measures and reducing your exposure to um, mosquitoes by doing things like wearing repellent and, and things along those lines. Um, and, and lastly, I just wanted to mention uh, your uh, warning alert systems I have found to be you know, very helpful. You've had those electronic boards uh, put uh, up along the highways in, in areas where um, there, I guess, have been reported cases and so forth. Um, are you, is that just triggered by uh, what you find in the testing or do you identify geographically vulnerable areas and you just prophylactically um, put out, you know, warning measures? Yeah, so that was in 2019 with the Triple E outbreak. Uh, the Department of, uh, this was part of a for coordinated response and working with Department of Transportation, we put out warnings to those at-risk areas. Um, so with electronic signs along the highway, uh, that was one thing that was done. That That isn't typically what's done. That was sort of a, uh, in an unusual circumstance. Um, we are doing a lot, either working through our partners with the uh, Department of Public Health with um, the local health districts. We put out press releases based on our findings. Our agency also puts out our own press releases based on our findings from the surveillance programs to, um, to warn you know, the local um, residents of uh, the risk in their area. We also post all our findings in real time and those are available on our website and uh, we always, we, um, with our um, press releases and our, and, our, and our announcements, we always um, have links to those sites so people can go and look up and see what's happening in their area um, when it comes to um, mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. So all of that information is available to the public. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, it, it's, and it's very helpful, but by and large, you know, uh, John Q, average citizen, is not going to be just going on the website to check. So those electric monitoring systems are really only when we are in um, uh, high alert mode. Yeah, really high alert. I mean, we don't want to cry wolf. You know, we want to reserve that for the situations where it really is the risk is really elevated and, and serious. Um, but and we, do, we do quite a bit. I can tell you, I, throughout the entire summer, I'm talking to the press and uh, a lot of it is through um, putting out press releases and announcing our findings and getting this information out. We really rely heavily on the, on the, on the pr public press to disseminate that information as well. And they've been very good about that. You know, they're very um, responsive to um, the work that we do and, and making sure that is, uh, gets out there. Yeah, and then that's what the public health uh, department premises, I guess, it's decisions because we've seen in some instances uh, school uh, moving uh, outdoor athletics and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, part of our interventions are too, like we work so, you know, closely with um, the local um, authorities 
and with the DPH and make recommendations about curtailing outdoor activities, particularly in, during periods of peak risk in late summer, early fall. So that may mean curtailing outdoor activities like sporting events. Uh, we will shut down state parks to overnight camping. Any sort of high risk activities, we will um, you know, um, uh, make recommendations to, um, to, to, cur to curtail those, uh, those uh, activities. So that how is we, part of it, the response. How have we done comparatively, uh, for example, with our neighbors with regard to, you know, fatalities and, and, and cases? I mean, because it looks to me like we have a very robust um, notification system. Yeah, I think we're, we're in line with the other neighboring states. Um, so like during the outbreak in 2019, I mean, just for, by, you know, we're all just, it's all hands on deck on a situation where you have a, an outbreak like we did in 2019. And, um, and uh, we certainly, I think are, you know, our others, just to give you an example, Massachusetts, we had four human cases that year. Uh, Massachusetts had 12 human cases, but they're a much bigger state, so. Uh, Rhode Island had three human cases. Um, um, so New Jersey had a handful of cases. Uh, New York um, didn't have any human cases that year. They were really fortunate, um, but their ecology is a little, their situation is a little different than ours in that um, their focal area for triple E virus is in a different, it's in upstate New York in a very different geographic area. But um, yeah, our, our response is in line with other states. The one thing we don't do as aggressively as say Massachusetts is they will do um, really large scale aerial spraying of insecticides uh, for Triple E. Their risk is a little higher than, than ours in that they you know have had a longer history with the disease. Um, and so um, they will uh, send out airplanes and spray entire counties with insecticide. And it's extremely expensive. It's, uh, I think they spent, uh, gosh, in 2019, I think they spent uh, six or $7 million. They still had 12 human cases. Um, and it doesn't eliminate the risk, you know, may reduce the risk, but it will never eliminate it. So it doesn't change your public health messaging, whether you spray or not. You're still, we're still recommending that residents um, take protective measures against mosquito bites and, and uh, do things like um, eliminate standing water on their property, make sure that the screen, screen doors and windows are in good repair, uh, limit your, act, your activity at and during the evening hours when mosquitoes are most active. All that stuff, whether we spray or not, will remain, you know, in effect. Thank so, you. Yeah, so the, just to give you sort of a, a comparison. Um, so yeah, we di states have somewhat different um, levels of, of response when it comes to spraying, that's, that's true. But we often will do many of the other same, similar things um, when it comes to public notification and um, things like uh, shutting down outdoor activities and closing camps and that sort of thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Dillon has her hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I did want to follow up on the question asked by uh, Senator Austin about any work that you might do on, on zoonosis, if that was the question. Um, if, if your primary focus is, is the vector-borne diseases, but you do do some lab work on COVID, which arguably is a zoonosis, yes? Well, yeah, it started out as a zoonosis, and, and we do have one scientist that is working on that and did um, 
uh, yeah, so I guess, yes. I mean, right now it's, uh, that's something that he um, took on um, just given the kind of the, um, there was, that isn't like our typical core. No, I know, I know. It was more of a, uh, due to the special circumstances, he um, yeah. worked on that, so. There's a lot of that. And um, Senator Hartley, um, there is a section of the statute uh, that we did after the death of one of my constituents from West Nile, which uh, after compromise only applies to my district or my town uh, because some people were alarmed by it, but it requires landlords to remove standing water from their property. And, and it, we, were, we, we learned there because it was a block from the salt marsh um, at, at, on the West River that there was a real problem with absentee landlords and standing water, um, you know, just pots or, or fountains or so forth, and they weren't emptying them, and there was a lot of breeding of mosquitoes. Um, it also required public education, which we did. But I don't know if that's helpful to your question, Senator, but I just thought I'd, I, can't, I don't have the site here, but I did hear your question and I think it's important. Yeah, a big part of it is just cleaning up the environment and eliminating all those sources of standing water that collect in garbage and trash is, is a, a big piece to the um, puzzle. If, yes, thank you. That's very interesting. Representative Dillon was not aware of that um, specific legislation, um, which obviously is still in existence, I'm assuming, uh, as we speak. Um, I, think, I think you're muted. I, I assume it's there, but the public education part was very narrowly drawn and, and, and that took a lot of work actually. Um, public education but there was a lot of alarm in the neighborhood you know and and there and uh there it was fairly clear that some of the environmental cleanup issues that that the tenants wouldn't have thought about necessarily were that the landlords were not removing standing water and and there was a lot of breeding going on yeah yeah um Thank you, uh, Representative Dillon. Um, uh, and our o OFA expert, Marcy, um, get your hand up, Marcy. Yep, hi everyone. I just wanted to draw attention to an item that um, seems to be an agreement with the executive branch for the transfer of three positions and associated funding for testing of recreational marijuana. So I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of that. Uh, it's, uh, again, three full-time positions and funding um, of about 225000 in the first year and 30500 I We have the uh, exact numbers, but just wanted to, um, Senator Hartley um, and Rep. Gibson, I did forward that, um, I know he's not here right now, but I did forward that uh, chart to your email. So I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page and aware of this item. Thank you, Marcy. Um, and so that's for year one and then 305, second year, which means that that would be the number going forward, the second year number. I can read you those exact numbers, Senator. So I have um, for fiscal 22, um, it's a total of 224,000 comma 377. And then I'll have the breakout of PS and OE for us. And then uh, fiscal 23, the total is 304,000 comma 065. And again, uh, and that's, that, a, it, that's a net net though, in terms of the budget, because it's a transfer, yeah. yep. right? And, Correct. And, and these positions are enforcement um, officials? Uh, testing of recreational marijuana, Mike, am I saying that correctly, Mike Lass? Uh, that's... Yes, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jason White. Uh, that is his area, but uh, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, those those three positions are laboratory positions. So um, we've been working with um, Consumer Protection Drug Control Division um, for the last five or six months. Um, they approached us 
uh, and essentially asked, um, you know, the question, what would it take to stand, stand up our program to, to be the testing end of things and consumer protection would be the regulatory end. Um, so they're, they're interested in um, doing surveillance of growers, doing surveillance of testing laboratories, uh, and also handling uh, consumer complaints. Uh, and given the complexity and all the different matrices that are involved, foods and otherwise, um, we, we agreed on these three positions and associated funding because uh, they also want this all under the scope of ISO accreditation. Um, so that was, that was the budget we, we settled upon and, and actually came to the agreement that the positions would be in, in our budget and um, just uh, you know through, the, through whatever process that, that then ended up actually accidentally being in their budget. So everybody agreed you know, immediately to have them moved over and that's kind of what this process is. But it's all uh, testing. Th th thank you, thank you, Doctor. Um, so, but what what were we doing uh, before this with regard to um, the oversight on surveillance and so forth of medical marijuana? So, me medical marijuana is is handled again. It's consumer protection drug control, but that's um, because it's a smaller program. It's it's the uh, private laboratories in the state that are handling that testing. Uh, there are three that consumer protection drug control uses. Uh, we have helped out. Um, occasionally, uh, since 2014, I think was when that started, um, when, when drug control needed some help, but that's exclusively handled through the, through the state labs or through the private labs. Sorry. Uh-huh. So then where are we leaving a hole if we're moving, Marcy, we're moving these folks out of consumer protection, uh, you know, what were they doing now and who's going to be doing whatever that was in consumer protection? I think, as you noted, Senator, it's a net transfer to the bottom line of the state budget. So I believe it was proposed in the governor's budget under DCP. They're just being now moved to AES budget. Is that correct, Mike? That sound right? Yeah, that, that's correct. The, uh, the governor had recommended 60 new positions for the Department of Consumer Protection for the recreational marijuana program. Uh, three of those would be moved to the experiment station. So those are new positions. So those it was are new in, under the governor's budget and now it's just being, uh, it's a transfer just from DCP to AES. So no net impact to the big bottom line of the budget, just a transfer from one agency to the other. Okay. Um, all right, that explains it. Uh, thank you. So I do not see any other raised hands. And I, I will ask again if, if there are any other questions from colleagues. Um, and Madam Administrator, if there is someone I'm not seeing, um, just give me a holler. Um, and if not, I just want to thank um, all of the, the, um, the trusted staff here of the Ag Station for the work that they've done, um, the good hands that we feel we are in um, because of their work. And um, uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, also seeing no other um, agencies signed up um, at this point, um, I will uh, conclude this morning's session of conservation and development and um, thank all of our staff and our uh, administrator for bringing us together and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of this warm weather. Hopefully it stays with us. Uh, thank you all.